This week's message is given by Pastor Stephen Ewing at Sakasana United Methodist Church on March 17, 2019. The message is, I forgive you, and is based on Colossians, chapter 2, verses 13 to 14, and John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Coloss Colossians, chapter 2, uh, verses 13 to 14. When you were dead in your sin sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be. So once upon a time, in their marriage, a husband did something stupid, and his wife chewed, chewed him out for it. He apologized, and she forgave. However, from time to time, the wife would mention what her husband had done. The husband finally said one day, Honey, why do you keep bringing that up? I thought your policy was forgive and forget. It is, the wife said, I just don't want you to forget that I have forgiven and forgot. <laughs> we know true forgiveness is a hard thing, right? It is hard. And I remember hearing a story from one of my seminary professors, Tom Rong, excellent preacher and teacher. And one day while he was standing in the library, he met a pastoral counselor friend who was carrying a heavy stock of books with him. So he asked, what are you working on? Forgiveness. The friend replied, I'm working on forgiveness. Forgiveness? What are you trying to find out though? His friend <clears throat> thought for a moment and, and said, I guess I'm trying to find out if forgiveness really exists. I don't really see much of it in my work. Well, of course, this may be a particular experience of a pastoral counselor. Of course, in the newspapers, in the movies, we hear the stories of people who forgave those who wronged them and their loved ones. And when we hear such stories, we are amazed and inspired by their courageous act, our hearts are moved and worn by their grace and compassion. But when it comes to our own life, our own relationship with people, maybe quite different story. Just let's be honest. Sometimes we do wrong, we make mistakes, we hurt others intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes we don't even notice that we hurt someone's feelings. Now think about when was the last time you experienced forgiveness, whether you were the one who forgave or the one who was forgiven. Have you ever wondered if forgiveness really exists? We know that some people are in the process of forgiving someone. For some people it can be a lifelong 
lifelong process, depending on the scope of wounds and scale of harm. Also, there are people who have a hard time fully accepting forgiveness. Forgiveness was given already, but they find it hard to forgive themselves because of an overwhelming sense of guilt or regret. This is also the case in relationship with God. Some people don't want to accept or have trouble accepting God's forgiveness, the gift of God's forgiveness. But throughout the Bible, God promises the gift of God's forgiveness. You know, Psalm 1-3 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Isaiah 1-18 says, Through your sins are like a scarlet, they, will, they shall be as white as snow. Ephesians 1.7 says, In Christ we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of our trespasses. In a sense, forgiveness is at the heart of our Christian faith. Jesus Christ truly modeled for us what it means to forgive. Do you remember what the first word he said on the cross? Exactly, exactly. Father, forgive them. That was his last first word on the cross. He asked God to forgive those who wronged them. Then exactly what was it that makes God's forgiveness possible when God says, I forgive you? If God loves us no matter what, why can't God just go ahead and forgive us? In other words, why did God's forgiveness have to come through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? As we think about this question today, my prayer for all of us here is that God may open up the space of grace in our heart to fully accept the gift of God's forgiveness and to continue the challenging journey of forgiving others. During this Lenten season, we are engaging Max Lucado's book, He Chose the Nail, what, what God Did to Win Our Heart. That's both worship and Lenten soup series. Last week, we talked about two different kinds of symbolism related to the crucifixion of Jesus, the crown of thorns and the spit of the Roman soldiers. And this week, our focus is a nail. In Colossians Chapter 2, which is one of the scripture readings for today, Paul talks about what God has done to forgive our trespasses and how the cross of Jesus Christ has made God's forgiveness possible. It reads, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. And in this verse, he offers his spiritual diagnosis of human condition as being dead as a result of sin. It's not that he says you were, you were dead in your trespass, not half dead or would be dead in the future. But God made alive with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So what Paul teaches here is that we were moved from being dead to being alive. We were moved from sin to forgiveness. So between sin and forgiveness, what happened? We know there was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, right? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ resolved the problem of sin somehow. Actually, New Testament authors draw on several concepts and analogies to explain how it was made possible. What Jesus did is often described as giving himself as a ransom or sacrifice, like the Lamb of God. Or as we read in Galatians 3 last Sunday, Jesus is seen as becoming a curse, observing the curse and observing the curse into himself and dissolving it and transforming it. 
Interestingly, in today's reading, Colossians, Paul explains that God canceled the record of debt, the charge of a legal indebtedness. Here he uses a business term to elaborate what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Anthropologist David Graeber at London School of Economics did research on the historical development of debt. And he argues that debt is probably the oldest form or the oldest means of trade because the cash and barter transaction developed much later. In the first century Near East, that bondage was the common method of enslavement. In other words, the charge of indebtedness could turn you and your family into slaves. So imagine what canceling a certificate of indebtedness would mean to debtors in those days. According to Paul, that's what Jesus did by, by canceling the record of charges, carrying it to the cross, and nailing it on the cross. In his book, Ricardo explains this way, quote, Between his hand and the wood, there was a list. A long list, a list of our mistakes, lust, lies, greedy moments, and prodigal years, a list of our sins. And Jesus was no stranger to the drive, driving of nails. As a carpenter, he knew what it took. As a savior, he knew what it meant. He knew that the purpose of the nail was to place your sins where they could be hidden by his sacrifice and covered by his blood. Unquote. You know, we didn't do anything to deserve this gift. It was given for free of charge by the grace of Jesus Christ, and yet we know how people respond to this amazing gift of God. There was a Christian attorney, after meditating on several scripture passages, he decided to cancel the debts of his clients that had owed him money for more than six months. He drafted a letter explaining his decision in, in his biblical basis and sent 17 dead, canceling letters via certified mail. Guess what? What happened? One by one, the letters were returned by the postal service unsigned and undelivered. Did they all move to a new location? I don't think so. Perhaps a couple of people had moved away. The 16 of the 17 letters came back to him because the client refused to sign and even open the envelopes, fearing that his attorney was suing them for their debts. What a sad story. Something that is happening in the life of many in this world. We all are dead for our sin, and God is willing to cancel it out of grace, but too many people will not even open the letter that would lead them to experience the wonderful gift of God's grace, the forgiveness. Another radical aspect of God's forgiveness is that it precedes our repentance. God's forgiveness precedes our repentance. Some of you might have heard a joke about Sunday school uh, child who learned about the importance of repentance. Her Sunday school teacher concluded her lesson and asked, can, can anyone tell me what you must do before you can obtain God's forgiveness? A little girl raised her hand and said, sin. Did you get it? Sin, to, to be forgiven. We know the answer the Sunday school teacher wanted from her class was repentance. But let's think about this from a different perspective. Here are repentance and forgiveness. Which one do you think comes first? Which one does comes first? Repentance? Forgiveness? 
The common assumption many people hold is that first we repent and then God forgives. But what's radical about God's forgiveness is that it precedes our repentance. Many biblical texts seem to speak this way. Let me give you a few examples, though. The beginning of my sermon, I mentioned that the first word Jesus said on the cross was non-forgiveness. According to our common assumption about forgiveness, the offender has asked for forgiveness, first then comes forgiveness, right? But we know at Calvary, nobody asked to be forgiven. Nobody said sorry to Jesus. And yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness preceded their repentance. In Mark's gospel, Jesus approaches the paralyzed man and tells him, your sins are forgiven. And the people were terrified by this statement. Remember the story. We know the poor man had not sought forgiveness, but healing. But the, the gift of God's forgiveness was given even before his repentance. I'm sure many of you also remember the story of prodigal son. To fast forward, the younger son was able to return home and be welcomed by his father, not because he had sent his father an apology letter or asked for forgiveness before he got home, but because his father had already decided to forgive him, welcome his lost son. The story of a woman in today's gospel reading is another good example. A woman was caught in an act of adultery. The religious scholars and Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground and said, The sinless one among you, go first, throw the stone. Bending down again, he rose some more on the ground, and hearing that, they walked away one after another, beginning with the oldest to the youngest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her. Does no one condemn you? No one, Master. I do not condemn you either, said Jesus. Jesus was the only one without sin in that place, but he skips his turn and forgives her. Forgiveness was given to her even before her repentance. Forgiveness is given to her first. God's grace comes first. So she is now able to fully repent, fully turn back from his sin. As, she, as Jesus said to her at the end, go on your way from now on. Do not sin. Now her proper response is not to ask for forgiveness, not to stay where, where she was, but to turn away from her sin and live a new life. That's repentance. According to John Wesley, repentance is a conviction, a kind of self-knowledge that we are guilty and helpless sinners, and at the same time, the children of God. It leads us to turn back to God by turning away from what damages our relationship with God and others. In this regard, God's forgiveness is the forgiveness that enables repentance. God's forgiveness is, enables repentance. Repentance is a rather a fruit of God's forgiveness and grace rather than a condition for forgiveness. Well, we may think if we, if we don't back enough, God's forgiveness would not be given to us. The essence of repentance, though it often involves the state of feeling sorry and remorseful, but is not begging for God's forgiveness as if our action could make God forgive us. The gospel is this. No matter who we are, no matter how grave, how serious our sins are, God has chosen to forgive us in Christ. He says, I do not condemn you either. I forgive you. So what is God calling us to do based on this theological understanding of forgiveness and repentance? 
what God calls us to do based on this theological understanding of forgiveness enabling repentance. If the teaching and life of Jesus is really a point of reference in your life, and if Jesus is really a role model in your life, then how does today's message shape your understanding and practice of forgiveness in relationship with God and with others? Think about this. We know how challenging forgiveness is. I, I hear people say that I keep trying to forgive him, but I just can't seem to be able to let it go. Some people say, I have forgiven her, but I'm still angry about what she did. I've been praying for months and months to forgive them, but it's hard. My brothers and sisters, no one can demand you to forgive someone because it's Forgiveness is a gift from God. No one can demand you. No one can tell you to forgive. I would like to invite you to consider, though, that forgiveness can still happen in you even when the person who wronged you don't ask for forgiveness. Of course, this is also what we can read from the secular literature on forgiveness. Forgive and just let go whether the offender asks for, for your forgiveness or not. Now we see it's grounded. The idea is grounded in our theological understanding of God's forgiveness. If you have ever forgiven someone before, she or he asked for, for your forgiveness, you know it's not possible without the grace of God. I heard once uh, about a pastor who did CPR for a man who had suffered a heart attack in, on, in, in, the, in the middle of the street. The past, pastor hurried to loosen the man's shirt and reach out for his <clears throat> hand and said, try to relax, we're here, right here with you. An ambulance is on the way. To the pastor's surprise and puzzlement, the man looked up at him and said, forgive me, Charlie. Forgive me, Charlie. The pastor stopped the, uh, the man's hand reassuringly and said, I'm not Charlie. My name is Sam. I'm a minister. I'll stay here with you until the help comes. Don't be afraid. But the man responded in an urgent voice, Charlie, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm not Charlie, the repeated the, the pastor. The pastor didn't learn until later that Charlie was the man's estranged son. They have been estranged for many years as a father and a son. Surely the man's breathing changed and his face turned really pale and it was becoming apparent that his condition was very serious and that he would not make it to the hospital. He whispered, Charlie, I'm begging you, please forgive me. It was now clear to the pastor what he must do. He embraced the dying man and said, I forgive you. I forgive you. A look, at, a look in the man's eyes signaled that he had heard these words. And then his breathing stopped and he was gone. The next day, the pastor wondered and worried about what had happened. I mean, what right had he to speak a word of forgiveness on, the man's, on behalf of the man's son? Well, he had no right. In the gospel story, we know Jesus was stooping down and writing something on the ground, and we all want to know what he was writing. But the Bible didn't say anything about it, right? So there are, there are a lot of ideas and speculation over the years from various sources. Some say that Jesus wrote the name of each person in that place, the accusers. Others say that Jesus wrote the sins of each religious leader. But I have a different theory. Of course, it's a speculation. But I believe Jesus writing a message not to the accusers, but to the woman. The woman caught and carried to be condemned. What was he writing to her? And I'm thinking of the three words. 
I forgive you. I forgive you. And this message is not just for her, but for everyone, for everyone in this world, those who are looking for God's forgiveness, the gift of God's forgiveness. Amen?